if I have to. Oh yeah, frames, exception. You're good to go. All right, thanks. Welcome everybody. Um, as I was getting ready to say before we actually started recording, um, we are now in the second chapter. So congratulations for <clears throat> spending two and a half months <laughs> in, uh, in the first chapter of Luke. In my defense, it's a long chapter. Um, and I, I think it was worth the slow crawl through it. I hope you felt that way. So now we have the Christmas story. So this, this ought to get you in the mood, huh? Um, now, the Christmas story is one of those lovely things that I don't want to ruin by analyzing to death. Uh, at the same time, it is a text. It's a story that is textual and it comes to us as a text and therefore invites us to treat it like a text. So that's what we're doing in here. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we're doing it early. So you have you know 25 days after this to flush any of the stuff out of your system and be able just to read it as a heartwarming tale again. Um, because I think it's a valid way of reading scripture. Oh, um, I'm not using that phrase sardonically. I mean it. Um, and to read it critically. So our time here is going to be to read it critically by setting it in its historical context and looking at some of the particular uh, that we find in the story. So let's begin by reading. And um, back in the day when all we did was gather in person and didn't bother with being online, I would invite someone else to read. But it's a little easier for me to do all of that since we're trying to be perceived by the camera. Luke chapter two, in those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. This ends the reading. Okay, so you, any questions that you have about either the story or anything I might have said on the recording? Let, let me start with a question. Les, you had some volume issues with the recording. Did anybody else have that uh, listening to it? Okay, I, I, I asked a few people just to make sure. Um, so sorry about that. Okay. Any, yes, Do you think they were planning a Christmas wedding after the baby was born? <laughs> <laughs> Do I think they were planning a Christmas wedding after the baby was born? Uh, I imagine there were plans like that. We we. Um, Does it ever say when they married? <laughs> well, here's the problem. Um, we have two different stories, and no, in Luke's story, it never says that they married or when they married, just that they were going to marry. But after the first, after the second chapter, Mary and Joseph are put off to the side and are, their life is no longer central to the story. Um, so we would assume that they married because that's the direction they were going, but we're never told. The other Christmas story that we have is in Matthew. And uh, Matthew just mentioned in passing after the child had been born. That's his Christmas narrative. Um, but then Matthew tells us the story of the Magi, right? Mm -hmm. The Magi who show up. Um, you remember when the Magi first come, uh, they go to the palace of Herod and ask, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And <clears throat> it's very upsetting. For Herod to hear that because he, he he was constantly 
getting rid of people he saw as threats, including some of his own children. And um, they inquired with the priest in Jerusalem where the child was to be born. It's the priest who told the Magi that the child would be born in Bethlehem. And they had seen a star at its rising or a star in the east. It can be translated either way. Um, and they inquired how long ago that star was first seen. <clears throat> and then Herod ordered the killing of every Hebrew male two years old and young. So it would seem that maybe they had seen the star in the east two years before and had traveled there. Um, I mean, that's just speculation. But of course, that's a horrible, threatening situation. So in Matthew's gospel, you don't have Jesus and the family moving to Nazareth and circumcising the baby and all of that stuff. What you have is a family fleeing to Egypt to escape Herod's murderous uh, in, uh, infanticide. And so in, <clears throat> in Matthew's gospel, there is one section that sounds like they are in fact married when the baby is born, uh, but it, it, it's hard to translate. It's a, we don't know the connotations to a lot of these words. And it could be that they were almost married, <laughs> officially engaged. You know, we just, it's just hard to, to nail it down. None of the gospel says at any point on this day they got married. I think when we read Luke, we should suppose that they did. That, that that's the trajectory that Luke puts us on. So we can kind of imagine it to its logical conclusion. At least we don't have any reason to imagine they did not. And there will be other children. Despite what the Roman Catholic Church said, there will be other children uh, that Mary will have. Jesus will have brothers and sisters. Yes. Refresh my memory. Does not Jesus go into the synagogue and read from the prophet Isaiah? And the question from the congregant is this not Mary's son, Mary and Joseph's son? I think the question, and in, in so you're talking about the story in Luke chapter 4. Uh, when Jesus returns to Nazareth, I think it starts in verse 14. Jen's going to look it up even as we speak. And um, I think they say, is this not the carpenter's son or Joseph's son? Oh. Yeah. Um, it's kind of curious how, how Jesus will be referred to by Luke himself um, on occasion as, as son of Joseph. Um, and we'll get down to that on the third part of my outline here. We'll talk about uh, patrilineage versus paternity. I, I selected those terms very, um, very deliberately uh, because I, I think they're the difference in how Luke is trying to describe this. Um, yes, ma'am. So, Paul, is not just Joseph's son? He's the one that's out directly referring to Joseph. And then there's a question in the chat. Okay. Um, Bill wants to know if we have what we know about inns or places to spend the night at this time. Yeah. So initially, Jen looked it up, and the question in Luke chapter four is, "Is this not Joseph's son?" And secondly, Bill is asking about inns, and and what do we know about that? I did try <laughs> to say in the in the video that I made, and I, and I felt like this was probably my least lucid moment. Um, <laughs> that uh, I expected to look at Luke chapter 24, the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus with these two people, and because they stopped, and I always had it in my head for some reason that they stopped at an inn, and that's where Jesus broke the bread, and when he breaks the bread, suddenly their eyes are open, they realize it's Jesus, the resurrected one, walking with them, whereas all the way they walked, and he talked about it. They, they didn't make that recognition. Um, in fact, they just stopped where they were going. Doesn't mention an end there. But this word translated in here in the second chapter is the word that's in the 22nd chapter when Jesus sends two disciples to find a, a room where he's going to have his last supper with, with the 12. And... Um, 
It's typically translated guest room in that chapter, but it's the exact same word. It's not a common word. So Bill, I have to say, I, I don't know much about the practice of in and so forth. I think we do have to uh, honor that in Middle Eastern cultures, and particularly historical Middle Eastern culture, uh, hospitality was an enormous virtue. And the fact that someone didn't have a place to stay would be a little bit of an offense to a city. Uh, in fact, you know, if you look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, the most likely reason why fire came down from heaven and destroyed those towns is not because they, they were filled with gay people, as many people like to prevent it, but because they didn't practice hospitality. And that's, um, I want to, I, I forget, I it might be like Obadiah, one of the uh, minor prophets actually mentions that as the sin of Sodom. <laughs> so, um, so the huge virtue at that time was hospitality. Uh, people are your neighbors. And, um, and, and that's how, that's just how you roll. Um, so Bill, I, I, I don't know what, it, you know, I don't know how many inns there would have been, how many guest rooms might've been available, what that means exactly. We do get a sense from the story that because of this dogma from the emperor Augustus, Augustus this decree that there's a big migration, internal migration going on. And, and you've seen when we've had internal refugees from a country where, say, part of the country is disrupted by an earthquake or something like that, people are moving around, just how unsettling it is for virtually everybody. Uh, the people who have to leave their home in Nazareth, um, the people who suddenly have this influx of visitors into Bethlehem. Um, been my impression that Bethlehem is kind of a cow town, you know, just a small little town that uh, uh, Matthew cites uh, Zephaniah, I think, uh, saying, and you, Bethlehem, although you are considered one of the least of the cities, so it, it's not a big city. Um, easy to imagine that it was a small town that just overwhelmed by suddenly people having to go back to their place of origin. Um, that, that's all we can say about it. I, I, wish, I wish I knew more about first century innkeeping. Um, I've seen some great Christmas plays based on the innkeeper and his wife. Um, <laughs> that works for me, <laughs> just not in a critical way. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have something that I haven't looked at, so it strikes me as weird, is the emphasis on firstborn son, because yeah. that, that backs up the angel and all that. But so much of like the, the Hebrew Bible and uh, Bibles about sons that were not the first son. Right. And so like, does that have anything to do with anything that firstborn is emphasized here? Or is that just? Yeah, that's a great, to? great question. Let me repeat it. Um, uh, so Jesus is referred to as Mary's firstborn son, prototokos. Um, proto being first, tokos being the same, <laughs> the same word that, that we see in, in the verbal form when she bore a son, the firstborn, literally firstborn. Um, so, so there are two streams happening in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Um, and Jen is, is raising that uh, very important point. There's a lot of emphasis on the firstborn. You know, when it comes to inheritance laws, the firstborn gets 50%. The other six can split the other 50 <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's a real honor to be the firstborn, and you're expected to carry the family, to carry the home, to carry the, the widowed mother, and all this. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on firstborn. And that's the context for which one of the really unique pieces of particularly Genesis stories happen, which is where God is constantly, I think Walter Brueggemann called it the law of inversion. God is constantly choosing the younger over the older. So um, Abraham and Sarah have Isaac, 
but Abraham already has a son named Ishmael, who is the older. And according to custom, he should be the son of honor. He should be the one for whom Abraham's progeny takes place. But it's not Ishmael, it's Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. They're twins, but Esau is born first. So according to the custom, according to the law, the law hasn't been written yet, but according to the laws that are going to be in place for inheritance and the tradition there, Esau should have been the son of inheritance, should have gotten the inheritance, should have gotten the blessing, and um, didn't happen. It went to Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, and it's his last two sons who are the ones who, through whom the promise is continued. Um, so it's, it's uh, I think Walter Brueggemann is right, that, that it's kind of a law of inversion. So you have the law of the firstborn, and then you have the law of inversion, where God is constantly choosing the younger over the older, the least over the greater. And, and we know that movement in Jesus' teaching, when he's constantly preferring um, uh, whoever would be the greatest must become the least. Right, that paradox, that inversion that Jesus teaches. Um, it's rooted in those Old Testament stories. So you get Jesus called Mary's firstborn son. What's going on there? And I think, I think what's happening there is less about inheritance and less about who among Mary and Joseph's progeny deserves uh, first place and more about in Luke, we start to see a growing awareness of this being a virgin birth. And so that's kind of redundant. This is another place in the video where I kind of tripped over my tongue. It's just like, you would think that if it's a virgin birth, it would go unsaid that it's the firstborn son. That is the and unless you want to say she's had several virgin births, um, and this was the first of many. Um, but then, then you're getting kind of weird. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think probably it's more related to the question of virgin birth yeah. than it is related to the Hebrew story. Yeah. I think I don't know. Yes, I am right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but that's a great question because that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. And Betty said she always thought it was more of a Passover reference. Yeah. Right, because in the Passover, uh, it is the firstborn lamb, mm -hmm. at, at least for that lambing season, the firstborn that you're supposed to sacrifice. That's the precious one. You're not always assured you're going to have a secondborn. And to take the firstborn and to sacrifice it is to show that you trust in God as your provider and that you're making a sacrifice, a gift. Um, yeah, it could be a it could be a reference. Um, typically, the language of firstborn shows up a lot in the Passover instruction. Well, yeah, yes, ma'am. In many European countries, that's still true, though. The firstborn is still sure. It is, you know, big. It's not a small thing. It's a big thing. Right. Yeah. So in many European countries, that many cultures generally cultures, uh, that true. that continue to be a, yes. a real value. Sure. Um, and, and one might imagine that the folks to whom Luke is writing, a firstborn just kind of has this honorific sense. Um, yeah, it's curious why he felt the need to use that term. Um, and I don't know if I could be any more speculative than I, <laughs> than I have been. Um, any, any other questions, comments? Uh, yes, sir. You spoke of the matter of hospitality being el primo and when you read about laying the baby in the crib sounds like that's as inhospitable as to be but we're not there add-ons to the residence where the animals slept and therefore he wouldn't be out in the barn someplace but in this auxiliary room. Right. And the animals were used 
importantly, for heating the domicile. Sure. So um, let's just make a reference to some of the habitat cultures in, of that time. Uh, some of which would, I mean, the, the lower floor would be basically the barn, the stable where you bring the animals and you're right. It, it had the effect of heating the upper floor. Uh, might have added some nice aromatic uh, fragrance as well. Um, and, uh, or, or, you know, the house, a, a house may have kind of a, a barn built into it in some way. You know, we got to get Midwestern farms out of our head, right? That everybody's over here in the house and they say, this is the way you get the barn and the animals roam during the day, then they tuck in at night. Um, here's the thing about Luke's story. We have no idea, right? We have no idea. Uh, I've seen people argue viciously. They have to be in a cave because that's where people would spend the night if they didn't have uh, uh, a room somewhere. I, I've seen people say no, they're 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 not in the a hospitality guest room proper. They didn't have a guest room, but there was space down there with the animals. Um, for all I know, they're out in the middle of a field and they found an old feeding trough and they repurposed it because Joseph is a carpenter and he can kind of figure these things out. And they repurposed it into a manger and found some way at least to help the baby find some warmth and comfort. Um, and for Mary to have a chance to, I, we just don't know. And uh, there's just a lot about it that, that, that's why I try to emphasize the simplicity of the story, that it, Luke doesn't care about the details. <laughs> just doesn't find that to be what we need to know. Um, you, you commented know. on the corn crib and that set my mind to. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I would assume that what's intended by that word manger is something like a feeding trough of some sort. The only other use of that word in Luke's gospel is when Jesus is saying, how many of you would take an ox on the Sabbath, take an ox from the manger and lead it to water? So I'm thinking that ox has to not only eat, but also drink. And that could be, you could be accused of a working on the Sabbath. Um, but again, there's, this, I love the story in that it allows us to imagine it as we do. None of your imagination is wrong per se. Um, and I welcome and invite you to imagine the heck out of the story. As long as we remember, none of our imagination is right per se. <laughs> you know, um, we, we can offer them as, as how we envision it. And then we welcome to hear others how they do the same. Um, but boy, we can't get dogmatic or documentary about this because Luke won't do that for us. He's very smart. Um, okay. Any other questions on the on the Zoom chat? We had a comment. Um, Bill was born in Holland, and his grandparents' house was in the front, and the cows stayed in the back part of the large farmhouse. All right. So we have a we have a witness <laughs> that you can share a house with animals. And uh, live to tell about it, and, and it's actually a very practical way that many people have uh, lived over the years. Um, all right, let's. Uh, so I tried something on on Monday when I was making this video. I wanted to give you a little bit of a history of the Roman Empire, just because I think that that looms large over all of the Gospels, and particularly over Paul's writing, and. Um, <clears throat> and I was afraid it was going to go on too long. So I tried to think that while I was making the recording, you know, if I know I'm going to cut something out, I just pause for a minute with a very uh, neutral face. And, and then I do something silly. So, I'll, so when I'm looking through it real fast, I'll see, oh, that's where I have to cut it. Um, I launched into this history. And by the time I finished, I mean, I was still on verse one, and we were 24 minutes into a 30-minute video. So I thought, eh, cut. So I went on and just cut that whole chunk out. So here it is, okay? We, we think about the Roman Empire a lot. You know, there are some funny little uh, commercials on television right now but from Caesar's Palace because the gambling is kind of a big deal. And so they always show them during football games. And there's this guy's always wearing a, a golden laurel 
you know, so he was supposed to be Julius Caesar or Caesar Augustus. They never really said. Um, but we have this image of the Roman Empire. It's an important thing, but it didn't just happen. So, so let me just give you a thumbnail history, and I am not a historian. If you want to correct this, please have at it. I would be in your debt. Um, but, but let's back up a little bit about three centuries before the birth of Christ. Okay. Um, about three centuries before the birth of Christ, one of the first great empires to affect Western cultural history was the empire of Alexander the Great, okay? And um, that's the reason why the New Testament was written in Greek. That, that even though the New Testament was written three to 400 years later, um, that Greek was still the language of the intelligentsia and international code and so forth. Um, that's because of the Greek empire. Uh, so you have Alexander the Great, um, and, and I'm not speaking approvingly or disapprovingly at, at this point of anybody. I'm just trying to lay it out, you know, time-wise. Um, after Alexander died, his empire was broken up into a lot of little pieces, but most to feuding factions. One would be called the Seleucids and the other, the Ptolemy. The Ptolemies were, um, were mostly grounded in Egypt. So remember, even though in the Old Testament, Egypt had been a major empire, it still had a lot of influence and power. Um, and the Ptolemies were mostly in the old kingdom of uh, the Medes or, and so forth. Um, When the second half of the book of Daniel was written, which I think was around 168 before the Common Era, um, it was after a Seleucid um, general, Antiochus Epiphanes, entered into the temple and sacrificed a pig to the god Jupiter in the holy place in the temple. Uh, that was that was a desolating sacrilege. And Daniel names it as such. Um, Jesus will use that language in Mark chapter 13 and other places like that. Um, it, it, it's meant to try to capture, imagine the most sacrilegious thing you can imagine. I mean, the most sacrilegious thing you can imagine, that happened. And it was a theological heartbreak you would think that God would strike that guy dead. And it didn't happen. <laughs> it continued to be Antioch of the Fifth. That was such an offense. Um, and eventually the Maccabean revolution happened. Judas Maccabeus, uh, his father and his brothers, and he um, actually were able to very successfully throw off this remnant of the Greek empire. And for about 70 years, Israel experienced self-rule. That was a big deal in Israel's history. And when people were looking for Jesus to be a king and overthrow the empire or something like that, when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem, you can imagine a lot of people had Judas Maccabeus in mind that this is going to happen again. Um, that, that's just one of those heroes in your memory if you're, uh, if you're a New Testament Jew. And um, okay, so... <coughs> That period of self-rule ended pretty effectively when the Roman Empire came into play. And now Israel, <coughs> by the time the New Testament comes, Jude Judea, Galilee, Samaria, all these parts of Israel um, and Palestine are under the rule of the Romans. So here's what's going on in the Roman Empire. <coughs> you see the first name I give you on your handout is Julius Caesar. Uh, conveniently born in 100, the year 100 before the Common Era. Uh, he was killed. He was assassinated in 44 before the Common Era uh, on the Ides of March, right? 
That's why we have that phrase. Beware the Ides of March uh, from Shakespeare. It was March 15th when Caesar was assassinated. He was assassinated by Marcus Brutus. So we have that famous quote, right? A2 Brute, right? You too, who had once been uh, a companion of his. Um, and uh, so Caesar died. So um, Julian Caesar had been part of a triumvirate, so three leaders. And his section that he was mostly in charge of was in like Spain and, and Southern Europe. And he was very successful as a general. And as such was gathering many soldiers and admirers to follow him. The Roman Senate told him, stop fighting wars and come back. And they wanted to rein him in. A little bit. So there's always a constant battle between the leadership, like the triumvirate or the Caesars and the Senate, because Rome is trying to be a republic, not a kingdom. Okay. And um, when Julius Caesar returned, he brought his army with him. And there's a river on the northern edge of uh, the Roman area proper called the Rubicon. The Rubicon, right? And when Caesar crossed the Rubicon with his army, he broke the law that you're not allowed to bring weapons and armies into the empire. Um, and in doing that, it was, a, it was a declaration of war, more or less. So when you hear people talk about, refer to a thing as crossing the Rubicon, that means it's a point of no return. Once you get there, the battle is on. And Caesar brought his army, crossed the Rubicon, took on the authority of the Roman Senate, and defeated him. To where he became uh, no longer a part of a triumvirate, but he was the sole kind of leader in Rome. And, and you know, just constantly having to do what's necessary to keep that power. Uh, and of course, in the end, on 44, uh, the, uh, before the Common Era, uh, he was assassinated. Um, so, so it's always a tricky thing, but, but that was Julius Caesar. And uh, along the way, he had a lover named Cleopatra, who was uh, part of that Ptolemaic regime in Egypt, um, often represented as an Egyptian. Um, she was part Greek, you know, it, it, it was so it's all about it, a lot of moving parts. And um, it's about as complicated and interwoven as, you know, Queen Elizabeth was related to virtually every king and queen in Europe uh, throughout her life, uh, lifetime. Uh, second cousin, third cousin, they intermarried, it was awful. Um, so, so you had Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. They did have one child, Caesarion. Um, it's not Caesarion. But Caesarion, I O N at the end. That was their child. He was never recognized as his child by Julius Caesar. Um, and um, after Caesar was assassinated, then there was again just kind of a vacuum of power. And so they had another triumvirate three people Octavian, Marcus Lepidus, and Mark. Anthony, or Antony, depending on whether you go with the European spelling or the Americanized spelling, all right? Now you've heard of Antony and Cleopatra. That's Mark Antony. Um, he took up with Cleopatra. In order to take up with Cleopatra, he had to, to divorce his wife, who was Octavian's sister. Okay. So among these three in the triumvirate, there, there's some rivalry. Octavian had Marcus Lepidus uh, stationed far away just to get him out of the picture. And he was powerful enough to do it. That really left two powerful figures kind of vying to be the next Julius Caesar. And that was Octavian and Mark Antony. Julius Caesar in his lifetime adopted Octavian as his son. This was a, not an uncommon thing for leaders to do is to adopt somebody who's already your own person as their son so that things would naturally go to them. 
That made Octavian very wealthy. Um, meanwhile, Mark Anthony is taking up with Cleopatra, who has a son from Julius Caesar, that they declare to be the rightful heir of Caesar. All right, which would make him very wealthy. Um, Mark Anthony and Mark, uh, Octavian and Mark Anthony uh, become rivals. At first, it's a propaganda war, then it actually becomes a war. And there are two battles that you should know. The first is the Battle of Actium. And this is off of Greece. Uh, Mark Anthony really made kind of a, a, a colossal mistake by having too many of his ships and foot soldiers isolated in Greece to where before long they were surrounded by Octavian and Marcus um, Agrippa, who's another general, very effective naval leader. Um, okay, so you got Mark Anthony here, kind of trapped uh, on Greece, right across from the island of Corfu, that area. Um, You've got Octavian's naval forces, uh, Marcus Agrippa. And just to give you an idea, um, Mark Anthony had about 500 ships, not all of which were fighting, but a lot of them were supply ships. Octavian had about 400. Uh, Mark Anthony had about 70,000 foot soldiers. Octavian had about 80,000. So we're really talking large scale stuff here. Mark Anthony, they, they fought. Mark Anthony was losing and tried to escape. He was almost cut off by Octavian and Marcus Agrippa's uh, ships, but Cleopatra's Navy enabled him to escape. So Mark Anthony and Cleopatra end up down in Egypt. Um, it's a pretty decisive loss. For Mark Anthony, he was losing, and after this, really started losing a lot of his generals, and and you know you would hire a lot of fighters, and they started leaving him. Octavian's forces were growing, so that all happened on September second, my birthday, um, in in the year. <coughs> what do I do? I have it written down here. I don't. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, thirty one before the Common Era, and almost a year later. There was a battle in Alexandria. So Octavian's forces had gone down to Egypt, where Alexandria is. And they fought, and again, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra's force lost, really decisive. Mark Anthony committed suicide. Um, the, the tale is, and I don't know if this is true, the tale is that he thought Cleopatra had committed suicide, but then he committed suicide. And while he was dying, he discovered she had not committed suicide and they had had some people carry him to her where he died in her arm. Um, and then she committed suicide. Uh, the story is that she had an ass, right? A poisonous snake brought to her in a basket that she, she used to kill herself. Um, uh, a stronger story is that it was poison, um, but she committed suicide. So they committed suicide. So now you have Octavian, who uh, is the undisputed leader of this empire. And Egypt is now swept into it. The Ptolemaic Empire is done. So what started as the Roman Republic and, and grew a bit under Julius Caesar, now under Octavian is starting to look like an empire. It's really grown and the forces have grown and so forth. Um, Octavian then is declared Caesar Augustus. Okay, so Julius Caesar, Caesar was actually part of his name, uh, almost like a surname. It was a proper name for him. But he was so powerful that even after he died, that name became a title. So Octavian became Caesar and was declared by the Roman Senate to be Caesar Augustus, which means supreme, revered, August, right? Um, that's where we get Caesar Augustus. And really Octavian as Caesar Augustus kind of saw the, the growth of the Roman, Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. 
during the birth of Jesus, Octavian or Caesar Augustus is the, the Caesar of the Roman Empire. Okay, that's who's on in, in the play. Um, <clears throat> you can see that he died 14 in the year 14. We, we, we used to say AD, now it's common, just call it the common era, the year 14. So during the birth of Jesus, Caesar Augustus, any reference to Caesar is Caesar Augustus. During the ministry of Jesus, the references to Caesar would be a, follow, a different Caesar, whether it's Tiberius or Caligula or one of the other Caesars. Caesar became the title. Okay. Um, likewise, at the birth of Jesus, Herod the Great is the governor of or the king of, of Israel, as it were, appointed by the answerable to the Roman Empire. Um, in the ministry of Jesus, there's also a Herod, but it's his son. And his kingdom's been broken up into four parts, and his son just has part of that. He's not technically a king, he's a tetrarch. Um, but it's all it's all right there. This is now. Why am I telling you this? Um, it's interesting. Well, it is interesting in its own right. So there's that. Uh, I, I I would say if you really want it to be more interesting, uh, get a historian to tell you the story. <laughs> Probably do a better job. Um, but uh, Luke, Luke just keeps make, making references to the Roman Empire. He just keeps doing it during this part of the story. Chapter one, verse five, in the days of King Herod of Judea. Chapter two, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus. The next verse, Perennius was governor of Syria. Chapter three, in the 15th year of the, Rome, of the reign of the Emperor Tiberius. That word emperor is Caesar. Caesar Tiberius, okay? Uh, this was a successor to Caesar Augustus. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was a ruler of Galilee, Herod's son, Herod, um, and his brother Philip, ruler of, of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene. So you can see that Herod the Great was king of, of Israel. It's broken up into different parts. And Luke's trying to name who, who's in charge of those different things. Um, Luke is contextualizing the Christmas story within the Roman Empire story. Um, why would he do that? Well, there are a couple of reasons. I think we can safely say, and then a whole bunch of things we could say. Like, one would be this is probably the most common way of telling dates. They didn't have a calendar that said this, this is the year 60 BC, right? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, it was only later <laughs> that we decided that the birth of Christ, or we were off by four years, but the birth of Christ more or less uh, was, was how you mark time. Julius Caesar did start a calendar, um, the Julian calendar, uh, but it was mostly about months and days and years. Um, and but, but this is the way of marking time. So if you want your people to know when Jesus was born, you tell them who was in charge at that time, and that'll give them the historical context. So Luke cares about historical context, and he cares about the political context in this, it matters. Uh, the second thing is that when you're living under the shadow of the empire, you know how important that is. And those of us reading about that 2,000 years later might easily not realize how important that is. And that's why I wanted to emphasize um, the importance of the first verse in our chapter. Caesar Augustus told everybody in the empire to go be ready. Probably didn't apply to Romans. And it didn't apply to wealthy people. Um, you know, there, oh, there were, there were double standards everywhere. Julius Caesar actually is probably the reason why, Julius Caesar, probably the reason why most marriages in the New Testament is just one man and one woman, as opposed to the polygamy and bigamy that you see in the Old Testament. Because he started within the empire or within his realm um, 
a family program where he wanted people only to marry one person. He didn't follow it. <laughs> he had a bunch of coffee bunny and uh, could, uh, was marrying whoever he felt like. No, his official didn't follow it. And eventually the citizens of Rome made it just drop the whole idea. But the whole family values thing started with Julius Caesar. And it's one reason why it was just common in that part of the world. Uh, monogamy was common as opposed to bigamy or polygamy, which had been common before. People of Israel were never, they were never unique in how they approached marriage. The way they approached marriage was the same way the Hittites approached marriage and the same way that their neighbors, you know, up in the Assyrian Empire mm -hmm. approached marriage. It was just a common cultural value that had changed over the years from polygamy and bigamy to monogamy. Um, Julius Caesar was kind of behind a lot of that. So the, the effects of the empire, it affected the way families were structured. It affected where people lived. And so there's a great migration between the Old Testament and the New Testament, a great migration from land owning, sustenance, farming people to city dwellers, uh, day laborers, and so forth. That was all because of the um, economic regime that they suffered under first the Greek Empire and the Ptolemies and then uh, the Roman Empire. So if you're Luke, and if you're Luke's immediate audience, you get it. This stuff matters. This stuff shapes the way we, we talk. <laughs> Your Bible had to be translated from Hebrew into Greek because it was less and less uh, the fact that people could read Hebrew because Greek was overwhelmingly the language of correspondence. Just think about that. Um, your Bible, <laughs> for them, Hebrew was something of a sacred language of the forefathers. Most of them couldn't read it. And would have, if the ones that could read, whatever uh, abilities they had to read in the first place, literacy, uh, most of them would read it in Greek. So it was a big deal when the Old Testament was translated into Greek. Most of the quotes from the Old Testament in the New Testament are from the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, not the Hebrew version. That, that's what it means to live under an empire. They get, to, they get to set the rules. So here we are. So when I started seminary back in the 80s, um, the Roman Empire was kind of in the background of the gospel stories and was treated as the background of the gospel stories. There's been a big shift in biblical studies now to where the Roman Empire is in the foreground. It's called imperial study of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's more in the spirit of the way Luke is telling this story uh, than what I learned back in the 80s, that the empire matters and you have to pay attention. So now you have it. Um, I did want to circle back to one thing and then I'll take your question. And like, why are there so many marks in this story? There's Marcus Lepidius, Marcus Lurius, Marcus uh, Agrippa, Marcus Brutus, Mark Anthony. Why so many marks? Um, why is there a, a gospel written attributed to someone named Mark? Why is there someone named John Mark in the scripture that might be the same Mark or might not be? Why is there a pastor? Why is there a St. Mark? In Newport Beach, why do you have a pastor named Mark? Um, and it's because Mars was the god of war. Uh-oh. <laughs> and to name your child after the god of war was to kind of set their path as a warrior. It was probably the most common name throughout the Roman Empire because of the influence of the Roman god of war, Mars. Isn't that? And if, and if you're named Mary, that's the same name. If you're named Marcia, that's the same name. So uh, don't just look at me funny. Um, yeah, isn't that, isn't that interesting? It's, it's the most common name 
in that part of the world <clears throat> during that time. And due to the influence of Mars, the god of war. So that's why you got so many marks for it. Yes, sir, you had a question. I'm just, one of the things that, that got, I think you pointed it out even, and I had picked it up, is in the St. James Version. I'm, uh, when the decree went out for everybody to go home, and I assume that was aimed towards the males, because the females, we don't hear anything about. Right. Mary doesn't have to go home right. elsewhere. Um, it was because of taxation. Why else issue a decree? I, I was curious, you just read the story on the surface and a simple story. Right. We're gonna go home, take a census <clears throat> for what reason? Right. And then he pointed it out and then St. James Version it does say for taxes. That's right. So the King James folks are making that interpretation for us. Um, I think it's probably right. <clears throat> um, the, the empire kept pretty meticulous records of how many people were where and look, this can be for good reason or bad. Um, my first trip to Nicaragua, I went with Len Navarez, and we went down to visit Amos, the medical mi ministry there that we've worked with a lot. And um, we went out into a village, it was like four hours away, across, we had to push the van across a, a riverbed and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's really remote. And in this village, they had a clinic that Amos had helped them to build. And they had trained some people to be, you know, kind of frontline medical workers there. And I was in there checking it out and just captivated by the wall because they had these big uh, pieces of, of poster board. And each one of them had a little description. There was one little trail that went through the city and had all the little town uh, houses marked on it. So every house in the village was just kind of represented there. And one of them said old people and would have the number of old people. Now, I, what they considered old, I don't know. I, I'm just telling you what was up there. Fertile women was my favorite. <laughs> Fertile women. Uh, and they had the number of women in the, each household who might be fertile, uh, or at least, you know, so age, what, 15 to whatever. Um, infants, they had them all. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? That, so in, in, in some respects, that also, I don't, I don't want to say it was just taxation. And that's why most translations don't go with the King James Version because, yes, taxation probably, for the Roman Empire's point of view, is the underlying uh, primary motive. But there are other motives as well. This will tell you. If you have a village in Israel and the Romans went in and drew their little charts on the wall of all the fertile women and so forth and had something like uh, military aged men, ah, that's important, right? Because you'll conscript many of them. Um, and the empire also, I don't know if they organized or simply forced people to organize themselves into guilds. So like Peter and Andrew, the fishermen, they were part of a fisherman guild, uh, which had to pay a portion of their profits to the empire, uh, but who supported each other and so forth. Um, so there were a lot of organizational, it, it takes a lot of organizing to run an empire, right? Um, and you're threatened by two things. Uh, the first is some kind of revolt, uh, but the second is running out of money. And um, so there are some not so lovely uh, underground reasons for a registration, but there are also some real practical reasons. You have to know that if, during a famine, how much grain you have to take to this village to keep them from dying. And that's kind of your obligation. Um, so, so the reason most translations don't go with King James Version is because yes, that's probably the primary ulterior motive for the registration, but not the only one. It was more than that. So others go with registration. Um, in, in chapter two, verse four, uh, we hear that, um, that Joseph is from the house and the family of David. 
I think that was true. I think when we're introduced to Joseph in the first chapter, he's identified by that as well. Um, I gave you some scriptures down there. We don't really have time to walk through all of them. You're probably very happy about that. Um, and one of them is Luke 193, verses 8 through 39. Uh, I think that's a misplaced colon. Uh, I want to call that Luke chapter 19, verses 38 through 39. Um, I would encourage you to go read that. Go read that part of Luke chapter 19. Um, let me just tell you quickly what each of these represents. Mark chapter 11 is where the triumphal entry happens in Mark's gospel. We call it triumphal entry. I don't know if that's, that's where you name it. That's where Jesus enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And in Mark's gospel, the people say, uh, Hosanna, um, and they make specific reference to the kingdom of David. And they call Jesus the son of David. Okay. Uh, in Matthew chapter 21, that's Matthew's version of that story. Um, I don't think they call Jesus the son of David in Matthew. Now, Matthew probably had a copy of Mark in hand and was using Mark as a resource. Why would Matthew leave that out? Well, there's some question in the early church over whether Jesus is properly called the son of David. And that question really comes to the fore in Luke chapter 19. Where Jesus asked, not so much about himself, and doesn't really use the language of sonship, but asked, why is it that the Messiah is called the son of David? When David himself said, and then Jesus quotes the psalm, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, uh, till I make your enemies your footstool. It's a very popular psalm in the early church. Um, and he said, if David refers to the Messiah as my Lord, how could David be his father? So we're back to that kind of elder over the younger sort of thing that uh, in their tradition, a father would never refer to a descendant as my Lord. It would be the descendant referring to the ancestor as my Lord. Um, it's a real weird, obscure argument that Jesus is making that probably can't mean things to us. You have to live in that culture and to know what's at stake for this to really make sense. But in the next chapter, when Jesus is accused of, um, of claiming to be a king and all of that, one of the accusations is... Um, that he called himself greater than David, something like that. Um, so I'm not recalling everything there, and the more I look at it, uh, I, I'm sorry for that typo, um, but those are there for you to go back and look at. It. The whole idea of whether Jesus was properly called son of David was, was an unsettled issue in the gospel. And I think in Mark's gospel, we don't have any problem calling it that. That legitimizes Jesus and gives you a sense of what the crowd, anyway, was expecting in the triumphal entry. Um, but then there's a question of whether Jesus, if that's the proper way of looking at Jesus through the lens of the kingship of David. Um, and so it's curious that Luke will refer to Joseph as being of the house and lineage of David. He will refer to Jesus, well, people referring to Jesus as being Joseph's son, but it's not clear that Luke would make the leap to say that Jesus is the new David and intended to be a king in that sense. It, it's kind of an open question. I'm sure that was, <clears throat> so, so I want to say there's paternity. He is called Joseph's son in some respect. And there's patrilineage. But does that mean he's the son of David? And I'm not sure that that's Luke's intention. I'm just not sure. Yes, sir. Given the nature of small towns in which families intermingle, intermarry, yeah. is DNA lineage that important 
in this story? So given the nature of intermarriage uh, in what we might call <coughs> incest or close to being incestual marriage um, in small towns at that time, is DNA all that important? Um, lineage is about identity. It's not about DNA. Now, of course, DNA is not even understood at that time necessarily, but um, lineage is about identity. That's why in Luke's gospel, you're going to see uh, a lineage identifying who Jesus is, just like you do in math. They're different, but there you go. Um, people were identified in terms of who their father was, or who their grandfather was, or who their family was, and so forth. We saw that with Zechariah and Elizabeth. The fact that he's from the lineage of Abijah, and the fact that she's from the lineage of Aaron means a lot. We don't carry that same sense necessarily, um, but uh, but yeah, it's about identity. It's not about your gene pool. Um, and 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 adoption is one reason why, more than intermarriage, is adoption. Um, adoption matters. That became your lineage. Be adopted. That's a key term for the Apostle Paul, because adoption is a, a real thing. You become someone else. You become part of uh, a, a family heritage when you are adopted. It, it, you're, yeah. yeah, you're not a step child. You're not a, you know, a secondary. When you're adopted, you're adopted. And you get all the rights and benefits of the lineage. That's a big deal. Okay, speaking of big deal, it is 1034. We started four minutes late. We ended four minutes late. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, let's do this again next week. We'll have shepherds to talk about. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Come in and stop the recording.